Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. We are still waiting for Dr. Senek's slides to get uploaded, so it'll be about 30 seconds or so more, hopefully, and then we'll get started. Thanks for waiting. Uh, thank you, Jordan, for setting up this webinar. Uh, and I am honored to um, introduce Dr. Robert Senek, a professor of marine biology and oceanography and marine policy at the University of Maine, um, who started a lot of his core research here on Sequoia um, a few years ago in 1972 um, and has just um, done some more work here in St. Croix and throughout some of the other Caribbean islands um, in the uh, Lesser Antilles and I'm excited to bring him on today to talk about um, some of the things that he's seen and what we can do to um, to uh, improve the health of Caribbean quarries. Uh, so I won't bore you too much more with uh, my face. I'll, I'll switch it over to Dr. Um, Stenick so that he can Well, you guys. Hi, everybody. Um, I hope you can hear me OK. Uh, I don't know if this is interactive or not. Um, Jordan, are we all good? Jordan? Yep, we can, we can hear you great. Thanks for being here. We're excited to hear your talk. Great, and thank you for your help over the, uh, the last several months and stuff. Um, right, I, um, uh, this, this is, uh, I, first I'll start off with a little bit of an apology. Um, I went right from research mode to, um, to entertaining my wife when she visited. Uh, so uh, it, it's been a mad 48 hours of trying to number crunch and get stuff together. Uh, so um, that's my caveat for today. But um, I'm going to roughly talk about Caribbean coral reefs and some things that I've learned uh, over the past 40 years and arguably over the last eight months uh, being here uh, in the Caribbean uh, for an extended uh, research trip. Um, let's see, why is that not giving me, uh, it's not moving forward, let's see, hello, uh, okay, um, let's see, right, okay, so, um, I, look, I think everybody here knows that coral reefs are among the world's most endangered ecosystems, uh, mm -hmm. that's, um, something that's, news to nobody, I don't think. But climate change and atmospheric change, things like uh, global warming, uh, acidifying seas are important stressors to coral reefs. And um, I don't want to uh, diminish their importance. But nevertheless, we still see healthy reefs uh, in the Caribbean and elsewhere. And it, it begs the question, why? Uh, because it sort of suggests that uh, there might be things going on that are local, that are really important for the conservation and the resilience of coral reefs. Um, so I'm going to share with you some of the things I've learned over the last 42 years on reefs, and also really the last eight months while I've been studying the reefs of the Eastern Caribbean. And I think one of the big goals is to identify what some of the key interactions are that are important to the health of coral reefs. Um, you know, it's, you'd, you'd think, um, or maybe people who haven't thought too deeply about coral reefs, I, you'd think it might be an infinite list. And I, I really don't think it is. I think we have the capacity to separate the uh, strong drivers uh, and uh, focus on a few that are likely to be most important for our conservation efforts. And one of the themes that I think is important that I hope I can develop in today's talk is that um, there are very important feedbacks between coral reefs and reef fish. Uh, and uh, if we don't get that right, uh, there's really very little hope that uh, coral reefs will remain coral as opposed to some other kind of reef. And why, I, I, you know, uh, uh, I think some of these are important to St. Croix reefs, um, and because I'm, I'm here in St. Croix now, but I think that they're generally important. OK. so. Um, I've been working uh, throughout the Caribbean, and um, uh, uh, let me see if this graphic works. No, it doesn't. Uh, I, I have to apologize. The, um, there's a computer incompatibility between uh, Kemet's computer and my PowerPoint. So uh, this is actually a slide of the Caribbean, and 
I started working in St. Croix in 1972, and since then I've worked all over the Caribbean, but um, uh, those are all the sites prior to this trip where I've worked, and this trip has been focused on uh, the Eastern Caribbean, so I complete the archipelago. Uh, I was within 100 miles of Venezuela when I finally sailed to St. Croix. But, you know, one of the things about um, having been working on coral reefs and in particular reefs um, in the Caribbean and St. Croix for so long is that uh, you get to uh, look back and think about how things have changed. And uh, I have to realize that um, uh, it's not just coral reefs that have changed. Um, this is me in 1972, and if you could see me now, you'd, you'd know that I'm bald. And uh, back then I had hair. Um, uh, the, the salute of the period was, of course, the um, ubiquitous uh, peace sign. Uh, I'm holding a, a Tripnusti sea urchin in the other hand. Uh, but the key bit here is that behind me was a backdrop of uh, a cropper palmata, the elkhorn coral. Uh, in, it was ubiquitous. We hardly would spend any time uh, taking pictures of that because it's just like everywhere. Now, 1972 was before there was any real obvious known disease. We never would see Coralophyll or any of the coral eating snails on it. Uh, it just was this incredible near monoculture of corals that made up the reefs. And it wasn't just necessarily the reefs of today or, or 42 years ago. Um, we know from drilling these and carbon-14 dating these reefs, uh, they've been building um, uh, Elkhorn coral reefs for at least 10,000 years at this location. So uh, we know that this is a place where, where that coral and, and this reef ecosystem has thrived for millennia. And so <clears throat> Um, about a, a month or two before I left on the trip that I'm on now, I found an envelope that happened to be a bunch of black and white photographs that I took in 1972 in St. Croix, but I never had printed them. And when I printed them, I saw, uh, granted, black and white, but nevertheless, the fields of, of beautiful elkhorn coral with uh, what looks like a small fish, which is a, probably a three-foot-plus barracuda in it for scale. Um, I swam over the spot where I took this photograph a couple of days ago, and it's a graveyard now. Um, but back in the day, we would see groupers readily. Uh, we saw Goliath groupers and uh, Nassau, and this is a tiger grouper that I took. Um, in the last eight months, um, my team has, uh, we, we used something on the order of 280 tanks of air uh, on the surveys that we're doing. We didn't see a single tiger grouper. Um, so when I was working uh, on my dissertation in 1980 at a, at a spot on the Teague Bay Reef, um, I took these photographs. Uh, and then about five years later to, to about eight years later, we found uh, all the um, Acropora coral had died. And then in 1989, uh, Hurricane Hugo, a Category 4 hurricane hit, and it just leveled my, my mid four reef site. And, and if you look at that, there's a deposit of sediment everywhere. It was pretty much of a dead reef. It was dead Acropora palmata. And um, the same was happening in Jamaica. Th these are photographs I took in shallow and mid-depths uh, in Jamaica. At, um, and then uh, that was 1978. Ten years later, uh, that's exactly the same dendrogyra coral, but the, the reef has changed entirely. And, I've been back, I went back last year to the same site, it's still an algal covered reef. So uh, this is what we call a phase shift to seaweeds. And um, this has been uh, something that's happened uh, in many places and it creates a problem. Uh, it's it's uh, one that I think uh, is worth our attention uh, in my talk today. This happened to be a photograph I took in Jamaica in uh, last year. And uh, you can see the algal abundance has not diminished uh, in the decades since I was there last. This is a photograph I took in Antigua uh, back in December, uh, clearly an algal covered reef, very little uh, live coral. Now this is a picture I took uh, about 11 years ago in uh, the Bahamas uh, with an algal dominated reef. So it's, it's ubiquitous, uh, but it's not everywhere. Because I've also spent about the same amount of time working in Bonaire, uh, and there we find 
high, much higher coral cover, uh, much lower algal biomass than any place else. And uh, this small amount of seaweed is uh, probably a very important aspect. You know, people don't think about seaweed as being all that important, but I think it might be the single most important uh, component of a coral reef uh, if for no other reason its presence is trouble for corals in many ways. In the very first days of my research, uh, in from 1997 uh, through about 2005, I, I had uh, areas in the Yucatan, uh, Glovers, Honduras, Guatemala, St. Croix, Bonaire, St. John, and um, and the Bahamas, and uh, I had a couple more in Mesoamerica. Um, but what struck me as, as really interesting, besides the fact that this graphic is really bizarre, um, and that's not my fault, but it's kind of cool, um, is Bonaire. There's Bonaire, Southern Caribbean, um, where we see a different world. Bonaire has relatively abundant herbivorous fish uh, that are, are, I think are critically important to this ecosystem. Um, if you look at a plot of herbivore biomass, just the abundance of herbivores, this includes the, the, the parrotfish, which I think are most important, I'll get back to that, uh, and the tangs in, in particular, um, relative to seaweed abundance, and this is any one of a number of measures of that could be biomass, what we end up seeing is um, bone air has the highest herbivore biomass by far, at least it did for this study, uh, it, it's, it's slipped a little bit, and by far the lowest algal abundance. Um, Jamaica is the, the polar opposite. And one of the things that's kind of interesting is, uh, uh, is just thinking about what this means uh, to, the, to the coral reefs. Because this isn't the first time people point out that you have an inverse relationship between herbivorous fish and seaweed. This is uh, Williams and Palunin paper published in 2001. The, the important thing is the so what. So okay, you know, yeah, grazing fish eat algae, it's gone. Well, these seaweed carpets are important because they can stress corals by simply reducing the coral feeding. They can smother the corals by literally overgrowing them. Uh, Doug uh, Rosher's work um, uh, has shown that they poison corals. They have chemicals that leak out of them that uh, on contact with corals will kill the corals. Um, they reduce the reproductive output of corals. They make corals more disease prone. And this, this is all, all you know, basically uh, talking about the adult corals. Uh, but importantly, they reduce the habitat for baby corals. Now that's kind of the one-two punch. If it's actually killing the adult corals and making life bad for the babies, uh, we've got trouble in River City. Now we all know that um, there's lots of documentation of the decline of corals. This is the, the plot by Gardner, 2003 showing a general decline in coral abundance. And people don't uh, argue that this decline didn't happen. They're simply arguing about exactly what the slope is and exactly where we are today. Uh, but everybody would agree that coral abundance is less than it was in the past. Well, what's interesting is that bone air comes out uh, really at about the, the, average, the coral cover that is, was common back in the 1970s. And so what we have found is that Bonaire's reefs are relatively resilient. And, and by that I, I mean um, they resisted the shift to seaweed. When, when diadema succumbed to the disease in 1983 and 1984, the diadema that were present in Bonaire died, but there was never a shift to, uh, to seaweed, the way there was in St. Croix and the way there was in Jamaica. The reefs uh, today are in full recovery from the Hurricane Lenny that hit in 1999. Um, at least there's a lot of growing corals. Uh, last time I was there, and I go there every other year. And in 2010, uh, in uh, October and November, there was a bleaching event. And my last trip there, which was last year in March, uh, we saw clear signs of recovery from that. So. What we're seeing is uh, the, res the capacity of this ecosystem to resist a phase shift and the capacity of this ecosystem to recover. This is a resilient ecosystem. So why are the reefs recovering? Um, it basically boils down to, to this. Um, there are really two ways that, uh, that corals go through life. 
uh, they can recruit at some point after the after they've had um, sexual reproduction, whether they're broadcasters or brooders, uh, and a little coral planula you can settle on the seafloor and start growing. The other way is that corals can get bigger, they can break apart, they can keep growing. Uh, one obviously is sexual, one is what one is asexual. And um, part of the uh, the thinking in the Caribbean has always been that you have elkhorn corals and you have montastria or mound corals as the dominant reef builders. And they're broadcasters. But they rarely recruit as baby corals. And this is known for decades. This was known before we had any concern about decline of corals. The thought was that these corals start off life, um, they're small. And when they're small, they're vulnerable to dying. If, if a parrotfish takes a bite or if, if uh, some sediment falls on them, they're tiny and they're going to die. Uh, as a matter of fact, our own research found that 90% that of most uh, settled corals die in the first year. 90%. So the success is by the remaining 10%. But as they get bigger, the chances of them getting injured increases, but their chances of dying declines. This is a classic paper by Jackson and Hughes and another paper by Hughes and Jackson. Clearly, they couldn't figure out who should be the senior author. And, um, and what we, the, the paradigm we had was the Caribbean coral reefs are dominated by immortal giants. These are big corals. Uh, they grow, they propagate vegetatively. They don't recruit. They don't need to recruit because they are immortal and they'll just keep growing this way. And then we had diseases hit the immortal giants. And we saw that they weren't immortal. And it fundamentally changed our whole way of thinking about Caribbean reefs. Suddenly, coral reefs that didn't need recruitment to maintain themselves, desperately needed recruitment to maintain themselves. It wasn't with the acropory corals. It's a whole different suite of corals that are now dominating Caribbean reefs. And it's a spoiler alert, but Caribbean reefs are now dominated by Parides asteroides, the mustard hill coral. So I got very interested in this uh, and started researching baby corals. And you know, it was pretty obvious that um, coral recruitment has to at least match rates of disturbance or, or coral reefs are in a death spiral. Now grazing fish that control seaweed also make the reef a better place for corals. And this is my conclusion because I figure most of you will be asleep by the time I get there. Um, so I'll just, I'll just blurt it out. So now you know where I'm going with this. So what I did is I put out coral settlement plates. All those locations that I showed you in the earlier figure is where I put these plates out. But I put out a bunch of plates at each side. I used a pneumatic drill. My hearing isn't what it used to be because of it. And uh, what we, why we do that is because the corals um, settle on the underside of uh, the outer edge of these plates. And that's where we look for baby corals. And when we look for the baby corals, the number of baby corals per plate we were finding was greatest in Bonaire that had the lowest algal biomass and Belize that had the highest algal biomass had the fewest number of baby corals. Well, this is really interesting. Uh, this is what the coral plates look like. There's the, and 85% are in this distal edge and um, uh, at the time I did that five regions, 1300 plates, but I I since did about five times that number in all these other sites. So we have very good data. And this is Susie Arnold's dissertation was done this way. I was kind of just an overqualified uh, technician for her. But um, basically, these corals that settle on the undersides uh, are able to grow out and into full sunlight. They don't grow, they don't settle on the upper surfaces because uh, that's where those corallines would overgrow them, parrotfish would eat them, other seaweeds would readily grow on these upper surfaces. At least that's, I think, why they, they're in the, in the lower place. But if you think about it, nooks and crannies are created by coral. And the best thing to create nooks and crannies are the elkhorn corals. And they died. So the recruitment potential of the seafloor was significantly reduced just by that mortality event. And then you have to think about what happens when you have a phase shift on top of that. Well, the seaweed, this happens to be in St. Croix. This is Buck Island at 10 meters. But the plates that I put down, when I came back a year later, they were completely surrounded by, by seaweed. Um, this is Halomita opuntia, for those of you who 
are interested. This one has thick Yoda around it. But what ends up happening is the coral larvae have to get into this space. And the seaweed could literally block the habitat, the microhabitat, which is their nursery habitat. And when I would pull these plates up after having them down for a year, uh, it wasn't that we didn't find baby corals there. We didn't find virtually anything in there. Um, this, this is amazing, and this does not bode well. When you get a blanket of, of, of this nature covering all the nooks and crannies on a reef, the recruitment potential of the, of the reef has got to be dropped out of sight. So you have no floating larvae, you have no baby corals, it's really part of the big death spiral. Now that's really in contrast to what we see in Bonaire where there's lots of grazing, uh, we find very little algae, uh, we find those nooks and crannies whether it's on the Montastria heads or on the plates themselves and, and that is a perfectly good place for these baby corals to go. Now one of the, one of the critters that lives in that little microhabitat, uh, especially in Bonaire, is a coralline called Titanoderma prototypum. And not that that's going to be on the exam or anything, but uh, that happens to be an early successional species that likes to live in these kind of subcryptic habitats. Um, they have other characteristics that allow the corals to, uh, to, to detect them. We publish papers on that. And they survive better on them than they will on other substrates. So this is actually literally something that is a great nursery habitat compared to this happens to be a damselfish territory with a big fuzz of, of turf. That's not a very good habitat. And this habitat would be the very last thing a settling coral larva would see before it dies. So food web interactions really matter. Um, you've got herbivores that are capable of uh, grazing, and that's the big ones, the important ones being parrotfish and urchins, and I'll get back to that a little bit. Um, they suppress seaweed, and seaweed otherwise would dominate the system. As long as it's suppressed, the crustose corallines can do well. And if the crustose corallines do well, and the facilitators do well, then the corals will do well, and the reef does well. It's a, it's a reasonably good, positive interaction. But one thing, one of the things we've been seeing, uh, and, I, and this is something I have to, uh, you know, think about, is that when I first lived in St. Croix between 1972 and 1974, fish traps were really rare here. Uh, I was going from St. Croix to Jamaica, and that's where I saw fish traps. At first, I didn't know what they were. I had never seen fish traps in, in St. Croix. The trouble is, um, people used to fish for groupers and snappers, and as they got rare, they started moving to other means of fishing. And um, unfortunately, now fish traps are commonplace. I actually had one dropped on top of me in Buck Island in uh, 2003, and that was supposed to be a protected area. But the fish, parrotfish in particular, they like to go inside traps to sleep. They sleep in caves, and then they get trapped in there, and then they die in there. So. Um, the problem is that if you look uh, all over the Caribbean, uh, you'll see a trend. We published a paper, Pete Mumby was a senior author on this from Belize, and it describes fishing down Caribbean food webs. It describes the way snappers, groupers, and barracudas start disappearing, and how the market starts uh, targeting parrotfish for consumption, because pretty much it's the last one around. I remember people in St. Croix telling me they would never eat a parrotfish. But now it's, it, it's apparently uh, favored by some people. Um, this is a fish market in St. Thomas. But it's ubiquitous. These happen to be parrotfish from the Indo-Pacific, but this was a fish store in Boston. And so we see that, that uh, there's an international market for them. And the bottom line is that I think really extreme caution should be ma made when you're managing a species like parrotfish that are very strong drivers of ecosystem health. So the bottom line is that uh, we're dealing in a complex ecosystem, and humans are very much a part of that ecosystem. And so we should always be thinking about linking the ecological and social networks. The ecological system is one where the coral reefs are important for fish, but of course the fish are important for the coral reefs. And when you add the human dimension, the social system, you have the fish are important to the fishermen, so the fish are important to both the reefs and to fishermen, 
And so the fishermen can have a big effect uh, on the reefs themselves. Um, put a slightly different way, and one could argue a rather academic and nerdy way, um, Pete Mummy and I wrote a paper some years ago about coral reef management and conservation in, in the light of evolving ecological paradigms. And the evolving paradigm basically is uh, pointing out that the scientific community believed that the immortal giants would live forever. There's even a paper that I found um, by Potts that said that the, the most serious uh, disturbance that could happen to the Caribbean would probably be the next ice age. Um, well, these feedback loops are important because the coral reefs, when they are, are healthy uh, and have a lot of uh, habitat architecture, um, have, a, have uh, grazing fish that are able to graze and reduce the algal cover. And that reduced algal cover increases coral recruitment. And the coral recruitment then, if they grow up, will increase coral cover. And by doing that, they end up focusing the remaining grazers on the remaining space, so the grazing intensity increases. At the same time, when the corals grow up, they increase structural complexity. That structural complexity is good for uh, increasing fish recruitment, and that, of course, will increase grazing intensity. And um, uh, this all suggests for very positive feedbacks uh, of grazing, which, when you have an overgraze situation, it creates a death spiral. Too little grazing uh, ends up with increased algal abundance, declining coral recruitment, reduced coral cover, and you end up with reefs that are rather mound-like, uh, which we see here. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah. What's going on here? So, oh, uh, healthy reefs can recover from coral bleaching, and um, and the bleaching event of 1998 was a very interesting one because it happened worldwide. And uh, we can learn an awful lot. Uh, I was uh, studied in Palau, in Belize, and in the Great Barrier Reef. We had about 90% uh, coral mortality. And seaweed was rare. Coral lines were common. Baby corals were abundant. Uh, that's what you see there. And seven years later, we saw an incredible abundance of corals. Now, I have a composite showing that these reefs are clearly resilient the way they came back. Uh, upper left-hand uh, photo is from Chuck Berkland, then my photo from 2001, 2005, and 2008. And then uh, when we look at, uh, I was back 2012, the coral cover was remarkable. We were having a hard time finding places to put our experiments. Same is true for the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, it suffered a massive bleaching event and fully recovered. And so. The frequency of corals dying is not the, what's so different. These well-grazed Indo-Pacific reefs seem to be recovering very rapidly compared to Caribbean reefs. The Caribbean reefs are, seem to be much less resilient. And so one of the things that I wanted you all to know as a take-home message, I know it's not sexy, but uh, a real clear danger sign on reefs is algae. And a lot of people know that. And the question then becomes for managers and conservation folks alike, what do we do about them? And it's not just um, a simplistic story. Uh, I did an experiment, which is now in press, and um, that uh, it, it just looked at one thing. Uh, how important are large parrotfish? And to do this, um, I set up experiments uh, at Glover's on Belize and at Caribou Key. And this is a parrotfish exclusion device. It's um, it's really meant to only impede the biggest parrotfish. Smaller ones could get through. Uh, this is a control. So we had an experiment that had um, a parrotfish exclusion device, a PED, uh, and, and, I, and I really like this experiment. But um, then we have uh, a base that is uh, just a, simply a control. And then we have one that we call a naked plate uh, because we found by using that terminology we get more hits on my website. But um, uh, with that experiment, with two controls, and if I had my own computer, um, not only would you see maybe a little smoother presentation, but you'd also see these movies where this parrotfish, it would be able to graze wherever it wants because it's a control, uh, whereas the small parrotfish, they can swim right through the peds and they graze there just fine. But the big parrotfish uh, just go around uh, the peds. So, it did seem to be frustrating the big parrotfish 
and we had movie cameras to quantify uh, this grazing. And what we found was uh, the, the, it was the largest size classes of parrotfish that were most inhibited, uh, both at Glovers and at Caribo, by these parrotfish exclusion devices. We also looked at the plates, and we noticed that they had these bite marks on them. And by looking at the size of the bite marks, assuming that big bite marks can only come from large mouths, uh, we were able to show that uh, compared to the bear and the, uh, and the pet control, uh, the parrotfish exclusion devices significantly reduced um, the, uh, the grazing of, uh, of fish uh, on the plates. So just looking at that, uh, here's, two exper here's the experiment. They're all done in pairs. And you can see there's a micro phase shift right around the ped, but not around the control. And when you look at this, this is what we wanted to see because there's no change in connectivity. Same larvae you're going to get to both of these things. Um, but do we see a difference in, uh, you know, what, do we see? what differences do we see? Clearly, the macroalgal abundance is greater. Uh, I use an algal volume, which is the uh, percent cover of algae times its canopy height. It's an algal index. Uh, this one uh, shows a clear uh, increase uh, beyond 2,000 of the index. The coral recruits, when we look at coral recruits on the experiment, where the algae was most abundant, uh, the um, coral recruitment was lowest. And look at a whole experiment relative to the algal uh, Biomass. This is the abundance of seaweed on the x-axis and the number of spat per plate on the y-axis with the two dominant corals of the Caribbean today, Agaricea and Parides. And we see a decline in both, the Agaricea reaching uh, zero at around 6,000. But importantly, the reef building Parides, and this is really Parides, Parides asteroides, it's declining at about 2,000 algal index units. And so it looks to be a key driver. For, for corals. And, it, and the local extinction of reef building corals by algae at that level is an important uh, thing to note. When I look at this uh, number of spat per plate uh, work we did in Belize, at Caribou Key, and in Bonaire, we find a similar pattern. Throughout Mesoamerica, looking at Ternef um, and uh, um, Guatemala and Honduras, uh, looking at juvenile corals, not part of our experiment. These are corals that are less than 40 millimeters in diameter. We see a decline in juvenile corals relative to this algal abundance, suggesting that this is a very strong driver. It's affecting uh, the corals early in life, uh, and it would be really cl classically a bad driver uh, of coral reefs. So the key point, macroalgae drives coral recruitment. And uh, things like the canopy height times percent cover should be less than 2,000 if you're going to have any hope for any kind of coral recruitment. But that large parrotfish can control macroalgae, and so taking whatever efforts you can to modify regulations, um, uh, eliminate uh, the uh, harvest of parrotfish, as this has happened in Belize and in Bonaire, uh, will probably be a surgical way to uh, significantly improve the reef ecosystem overall. Whatever you can do uh, to enhance diadema, it has very similar characteristics to large parrotfish, except it itself is susceptible to predators. So if you have an extremely stripped uh, fish fauna, as we have here in St. Croix, diadema can do pretty well. If you have a fauna that actually is reasonably abundant with predatory fish, diadema does not do terribly well. So for applying science to improve management of coral reef ecosystems, coral reef ecosystems are complex with many stressors. Um, and uh, I think that even though reefs are, are very complex, there are relatively few key drivers that are very important for the resilience of these reefs. And I think focusing on them might be a very good way to improve the condition of reefs. And I think this is something that managers should monitor. And I know that we've made great progress in Belize and Bonaire getting uh, increased sensitivity to these key drivers since both of them actually eliminated the harvesting of parrotfish. And, um, and so, you know, I, one thing that uh, I was going to go into is, uh, is how we monitor for change. Um, and uh, do I have time? Am I, am I okay for time? <laughs> 
Unfortunately, I think um, okay. if I could ask you to wrap up in a couple minutes, but I know that people are going to have a lot of questions for you. All right. Well, look, I, I'm, I'm, I, I can just stop right there uh, because I have a, a more stuff here, but it's, uh, let's just go right to questions. Fantastic. Um, thank you very much. Let me tell people how to ask questions really quick. Um, you can either use the chat box anytime to send questions, and we'll keep track of those and ask on your behalf, or if you're comfortable, you can use the small hand icon to raise your hand, and I will call on you. You can unmute yourself and ask the question yourself. Looking for hands. Uh, David Kay, would you like to ask your question? You can unmute yourself. Uh, David Kay, are you able to ask your question? Um, I, no one's hearing me. I, we can hear you now. I can hear you. Okay, hi. It's nice to, nice to meet you and hear your lecture. Um, so what can be done throughout the Caribbean? I've, I've dove Jamaica, the Virgin Islands, all the way down to Tobago. And, you know, just like you, I've seen very few resilient reefs. And I remember what diving was like in the late 60s, early 70s. But um, it just seems like stopping parrot fishing I mean, uh, isn't going to do, do the uh, the whole job with all these other things coming at reefs, such as the, such as the warming, acidification, silt, runoff, all those things. Well, you know, you're right. There's there's not a panacea, um, uh, and I think that the best we can hope for is uh, trying to focus on the things that have. When I talk about uh, strong drivers, these are these are things that uh, have demonstrably high demographic impacts. So everything that I've described, and if um, and in the longer presentation I just gave the TNC folks here, they saw uh, how I apply many of these things more broadly in the work I've done in the last eight months from Anguilla down to the Grenadines and then over back over here. And one of the things that does show up very clearly is that, that the, the few areas that have active uh, protection uh, have higher abundances of parrotfish, lower abundances of macroalgae, higher abundances of live coral, higher abundances of uh, juvenile corals. Um, so, you know, is it the 1970s revisit? No, but it's better than average. Uh, and in some cases, uh, you know, significant 40%, in one case, 50, over 50% live coral cover. So um, I'd say that uh, we're seeing some circumstantial evidence that, that suggests that uh, if you can maintain uh, not just parrotfish biomass, but the biomass of large parrotfish, uh, you'll have a significant effect. It won't solve all the problems. It certainly won't stop all possible diseases. But we do know places like Bonaire that had abundant parrotfish and then suffered massive diseases never phase shifted to, um, to macroalgae and they maintain high coral cover to this day. Can I ask one, one a follow-up? Yeah. The uh, lionfish, obviously a big problem. Uh, can, uh, if you don't fish the, the big parrotfish, uh, are they going to be able to uh, uh, still increase in numbers with all these lionfish out there? You know, uh, I'd say I had one of the biggest surprises on this uh, Eastern Caribbean eight-month uh, trip was how few lionfish we saw, uh, which really surprised me because I've seen an awful lot in some places like in the Bahamas where I've worked. Um, in Bonaire, the ones that uh, we used to see them in shallower waters, now most of the lionfish are in deeper waters. And that's good. Uh, there's a lot of aggressive programs going on. It seems to be making a difference. Um, parrotfish have in their advantage the fact that they spawn every single night. Um, there is a huge number of baby parrotfish. They are much more habitat limited than they are predator limited. So um, I think uh, I do encourage everybody to kill every parrot, every lionfish that you that you see. 
uh, and I know a lot of groups have taken that up in a very uh, uh, active way. But the habitats where lionfish live, uh, especially their propensity to like vertical walls and slight caves, affect some fish, but not the recruiting reef fish that I think are most important to the reef. So I'm guardedly optimistic that the parrotfish is not the, uh, the Caribbean, uh, what is it, brown tree snake that, uh, that hit Guam. Uh, That's really good to hear. Thank you very much. We have another question from Fernando. Some scientists state that corals cannot recover after they reach a certain al algae coral balance called the algae phase versus the coral phase. What is your opinion? Hmm. Well, uh, you know, uh, there are some corals that are more susceptible to algae than others. Um, uh, things like the Elkhorn coral, uh, if they are uninjured, uh, they're actually relatively immune to algae uh, once they have their base established. Um, because they, they're simply not growing in the al algal zone. Um, there are other algae that are very, very hardy. Um, I've peeled algae off of Sideroastria corals, and I don't see, even see any, any discoloring. I don't know how they're able to make it. Um, the thing I don't know about yet is uh, the degree of toxicity. Most of the work has been done in the Indo-Pacific, in Fiji in particular. and. Um, uh, you know, I think that um, the creeping algal forms that tend to grow over corals, especially low-lying corals, are probably going to be the ones that have the biggest effect. Um, whether there's a whether there's necessarily a percent or a, a, a threshold, I, I don't really have uh, much of a comment on that. But um, suffice to say that um, when you have reefs like many of the reefs I work on in the Indo-Pacific, where macroalgae are really relatively rare. Um, you do see coral able to grow laterally, unimpeded. Uh, of course, you've got all these nursery habitats. So by and large, um, the less algae and the lower the canopy height, uh, the better. And just as one little aside, people are always asking me, if you could only measure one thing, what would it be? And I, I would say, just measure the canopy height of algae, full stop. Um, it is the single best metric of the health of a reef. And if you have low canopy algae, uh, you've got a pretty healthy reef. Thanks. We have another question from Emily Fielding. What are the other strong drivers in addition to the ones that you've stated, including herbivore abundance and macroalgal cover? Well, you know, uh, there, there are concerns about water quality. And um, especially if you're dealing with fringing reefs or high uh, island reefs where there might be a lot of uh, misuse of land uh, or not best practices for land use, um, sediment is a, is a very big problem. Uh, the dredging of harbors, um, uh, Punta Cana is, a, is a, an example of one that I, I looked at where the, um, uh, the Punta Cana reef was, uh, I think, blanketed by sediment. Uh, due to, in my opinion, uh, poor uh, construction practices. Uh, and that, I think, is the most degraded reef I've seen in my life. Um, other, other drivers, um, you know, you start getting, you could, you could write a little hierarchy of, of things that, that matter. Um, I became very interested in the role of, of carnivorous fish uh, on reefs. And I found one of the strongest cases could be made for uh, they control damselfish, and if uncontrolled damselfish abundance, they start creating uh, territories that are almost um, uh, like a mosaic without a gap in between. And they actively keep the grazers off that area, and you end up getting these little blankets of turf that is not really very good for the coral either. So um, that would be another interaction of some note. Um, there are some things that, uh, that impede the sedimentation of shallow, uh, cobbly, and loose corals. And coral reefs can't recover if uh, all of the pieces are moving around a lot. Um, and there are several studies in Pongo Pongo and uh, in Palau. Uh, is a, uh, there are places where um, uh, 
one of the things impeding the recovery of the reef was simply the inability of the reef to cement itself. So it's getting down into the kind of the weeds on some of these things, literally as well as figuratively. Thanks. We're getting a bunch of great questions, but unfortunately, I think we have time for one more. Um, everybody else, I would love to find a way to connect you with Dr. Stenick, as I know he would enjoy discussing his research more. So we'll finish with this question, um, and then I, I will conclude. Email. Great. I will, I will help connect the people on, <laughs> who are asking questions. Um, the, the question we'll conclude with is um, from Sungi Kim, wanting to know if you could talk about why parietes are the relatively dominant hard corals in the Bahamas and what makes them do better than other branching corals like Acropora palmata or Cervaconus. Well, that's a good question. I mean, one, one I think the, the low-hanging fruit aspect of that question is that parietes readily recruits. It's, uh, uh, it's either number one or number two I, on all of my settlement plates in terms of uh, most frequent coral recruiter. And that includes the Bahamas. I, I worked in Wardrick Wells and in Lee Stocking Island. I uh, had plates in both places. Um, it's a relatively hardy coral. Uh, it's maybe not as hardy as some things like Sidorastria, but it's a relatively hardy coral. Um, it, get, it attains relatively good size, not monster size, but, um, you know, uh, if, I, if I had the time to show you the, the preliminary results from my last eight months, um, uh, it is by far the dominant coral throughout the Eastern Caribbean. And I would say, if I went through my notes for uh, all the other places where I'm working, it's the dominant coral today in the Caribbean. Uh, the problem is it can't grow vertically at the rate at which a cropper grows vertically, which would compromise coral reef growth relative to sea level growth. And clearly, it's not a branching coral. Uh, and uh, Parietes aspiroides is much more abundant than Parietes uh, parietes. But Parietes parietes in the Eastern Caribbean is actually in the top three most abundant corals. So, and that ha is a branching coral into which some some uh, fish uh, readily recruit. So it has some advantages other than just simply building the reef. Um, this webinar was brought to you through the generous support of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation and through NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program. Thank you to everybody for joining us, and thank you to, to Dr. Bob Simmet for presenting to us. The recording of this webinar, as well as the resource links, will be sent to the Reef Resilience Network email list after today. If you're not on that list and would like to be, please email us at resilience at tnc.org, and feel free to send us any suggestions for future webinar topics. I'll be talking with Dr. Stenick about ways to follow up with the additional questions here. I'm hoping to interview him for our newsletter, so sign up for our newsletter if you're able to. Thanks for, again for your participation and look to our next announcement coming soon about our upcoming webinar series on unique approaches to fisheries management. Thanks everyone.